So hello everyone and welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, Sarah Peter and Adrian Thorogood are going to talk about data protection and security aspects of running simulations on personal data with HPC. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embel MBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions, so please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. So let me now introduce Permit COE. Permit COE is the uh, HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on the simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate the omics data into medical actions. The performance of uh, cell simulation software is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. So Permit COE is going to scale up the software for cell simulations to the present HPC exascale systems in order to enable the creation of uh, models of uh, medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it's going to, it's optimizing a cell level simulation software to run in pre exascale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will uh, show the applications of Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest such as drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patient's tissue. Additionally, Permit COE also has uh, as objectives training the biomedical professionals, uh, integrating the permit communities in the use of HPC and exascale permit tools, um, and building the basis uh, for the sustainability of Permit COE. Today's webinar is going to pay attention to a very important topic when working on the HPC environment, which is the data protection and security aspects. So let me now introduce our speakers. Sarah Peter studied bioinformatics and worked for a few years as a researcher and data manager at the Max Planck Institute. Currently, she's an infrastructure manager in the R3 and IT infrastructure team at UNILU, the University of Luxembourg. She is also the liaison for the HPC team. Since GDPR has come into effect, she spends a part of her time doing risk analysis for the Institute's IT infrastructure and the HPC cluster. Adrian Thorogood is a lawyer and research, at, uh, research and development specialist at the UNILU Bioinformatics Core. He works on different projects to address ethical and legal issues that arise when sharing genomic and health-related data um, cross-border and internationally. His research focuses on how uh, genomic sequencing platforms, information and networking technologies, open science practice and patient empowerment movements are disrupting research and healthcare. So Sarah, Sarah Adrian, the floor is yours. So then kind introduction. Uh, I'll start uh, kind of with the higher level legal aspects. And then my colleague will follow up uh, with uh, more detail uh, on the technical and security aspects of processing in HPC. Uh, so mainly to be focused on data protection. Um, so just you know, I wanted to, to um, <clears throat> I wanted to um, set up this presentation, uh, you know, connect it with some of the work that we did uh, uh, and have been doing in the permit uh, COE project. Um, so of course. Um, there is a work package working on legal ethical issues uh, in this project, so it is a priority for the for the permit uh, in this first phase as well as it will increasingly become important in later phases of the center of excellence. Uh, so there is a recognition that there is a potential for that we will be processing patient data, health and genetic data, uh, maybe even from vulnerable patients and at exascale, large scale. As we'll see later, these are key factors in terms of risk assessment under the GDPR and these different uh, aspects of what we aim to do. Uh, and then, of course, as we'll discuss, my colleague Sarah will discuss later on, um, you know, aspects of is that high performance computing center secure? 
and are the tools that we're using within that uh, HPC center uh, are they are they processing data in a safe way? So um, the first piece of work we did for for the project was um, you know we we started off with an uh, an ethical legal assessment. Uh, we focused on the use cases as Daniel mentioned. Um, following the European Commission ethics self assessment model, um, looking at the use cases of, of, of kind of showing that this the kind of software and simulations we, we seek to run in at, at exascale. Um, and in, in fo focusing specifically on the use cases, um, you know, again, the aims were to demonstrate cellular molecular modeling tools. Um, and, and, you know, we had to go and create an inventory of we had to look at each of the use cases. There were many in, their, in different disease areas, and we had to create an inventory of each of the data sets, and, and really look at ask, ask, and then start to ask questions: Are these, uh, you know, the main? Because this was a data-intensive project, the main question was: Are we processing personal data? Are there risks to privacy for, uh, you know, any if we're deriving that data from human subjects? Uh, um, are we? Are there ethical issues? Are there are privacy issues? Um, and as we created this large inventory of data sets, we did con conclude, we did go through each of them, we, and we, we noted that not only were most of the data sets used for the use cases, um, um, that they were derived from publicly available, they were publicly available data sets. Uh, uh, in, and additionally, uh, those data sets were generated, generated from analyzing, typically analyzing commercial cell lines, uh, which, which are publicly available anonymous uh, reagents. So while we concluded that in our particular use cases uh, that they didn't involve the processing personal data uh, by carefully assessing each data set. And it is, we did recognize that in, in many of the applications that are envisaged for, for uh, permit COE, that there's a potential uh, for processing uh, personal data as is true for, for a lot of biomedical research. And I'll just, so this, the first part of the presentation, I'll just go into this kind of concept of personal data and, and, and why it's, you know, it's something that will, will, constantly have to be looking for solutions where we are processing personal data and where the GDPR uh, obligations apply. Um, so I all should be familiar with this by now that, you know, the definition of personal data in the GDPR, uh, it's information relating to an identified or identifiable person. So identified, obviously, if you have their name or ID number, uh, but also, you know, the tricky aspect is where, where the data, you know, you've removed direct identifiers, but the data is still potentially identifiable. And, and so there's many different aspects and risks to consider. Um, so even if you, you know, the, you're the researcher uh, in the HPC environment, you, you may not have direct access to the individual's identity, but the data may still be uh, identifiable if it could be combined with other information to identify the person. If you're dealing with kind of inherently identifiable data, data that we treat as inherently identifiable, like whole genome sequence data uh, from patients, uh, or if, you know, there's a link back to the um, the data that that you hold you hold the link back to the data uh, identifiers or another member of your team does, and there's a potential you could access that or an unauthorized party could. Um, so, you know, the key point here is it's quite hard for the types of you know uh, the types of rich uh, molecular and health related data sets that that we seek to analyze at, at exascale it's quite hard to uh, kind of meet this high GDPR standard of anonymization. So there is a, a bit of guidance available. Um, it's a bit dated now. It actually came from before the, the GDPR came into force, um, but just a few key points and really highlighting how, how difficult it is to anonymize uh, uh, data and, and meet that standard of the GDPR. So first of all, anonymization is, is aims at irreversible uh, prevention of re-identification. Um, so you're really, it's about, you know, it's a case where you're deleting the identifiers and, and you never want to go back to the end of, you want to ensure that you or no one else can go back to the individual's identity. The standard, the legal standard for that is uh, likely reasonably to be used uh, to identify it. So, you know, there's this reasonability standard under the GDPR, but you have to consider it not only from your, your perspective as a researcher running the study, but also uh, from potential from other third parties uh, that may have access to other information about the individual. Um, and of course, you know, typically, there's insistence from data protection officers, for example, that that in order to achieve a standard of anonymization, especially when you're this this guidance is really about releasing data publicly, that the standard would really be that data is typically um, you know aggregated to a high level, um, and of course you've deleted the original identifiers, and uh, and or at least you've generalized as, as certain attributes in a way that that would make the data 
uh, not unique to an individual uh, participant. Of course, this reasonably likely standard has, you know, you have to take into account certain factors. So the GDPR suggests you take into account the costs of re-identification, the amount of time, uh, and the technology at the time of processing, as well as technological developments. So this will kind of bring us to, to uh, you know, another point that, again, it's this is kind of an ongoing obligation. It's an obligation of the controller, so the institution uh, that's hosting the research. Um, and, and, you know, there's two aspects to that responsibility or accountability. One, you have to demonstrate if you if you do want to rely on, you know, say this data is anonymized, uh, then you have to demonstrate that you've actually, you know, uh, you, you have a process in place. You, you, you demonstrate that it actually works, that, that it's, it's, it's not re likely reasonably to link back to the individual. And you actually have a proof of that. So you may actually need some sort of quantitative risk assessment there. So, again, this accountability principle principle says that not only are you responsible to comply, but you also are, must be able to demonstrate that you're in compliance with the GDPR. Uh, so that's where the documentation is really key. And of course, it's a continuous exercise. So if you're using data sets, you know, in this case, we're often using data uh, secondary use of data sets. We're, we're potentially reusing data sets. And so as, as maybe there's technological developments or more information available over time, that, that this needs to be verified over time if you're continuously using data sets. So again, from a legal perspective, difficult to meet the standard of anonymization. From a scientific perspective, as you all know, there's also, you know, it may be undesirable to, to be working with um, anonymized data. Uh, so we're looking at balancing, you know, uh, there's a trade-off as, as we start to generalize attributes, delete attributes or aggregate data that we, we lose some of the utility. So again, I think typically in, in a lot of Data intensive biomedical research, and particularly in this in this precision medicine area, um, you know, a more optimal solution is to rely on, in most cases, to rely on pseudonymized data. Now, pseudonymized data, the definitions there from the GDPR that that um, there, there essentially there is a link back to the individual's identity. Uh, additional information, such as, for example, a key code, are available that would link the research data set to the individual's identity. Uh, so you want to maintain that link, but you want to keep it very secure. So there might be good, good scientific reasons you want to go back to the individual to link data, to collect more data that might be good. Ethical and privacy reasons you want to go back to the individual, for example, to return incidental findings. Um, but you want to make sure that that link is secure, that that, that a data set of identifiers is kept secure in one place. And of course, when you're working with HPC, that those identifiers do not need to go to the HPC. Uh, uh, it's just the, the, the research payload that needs to be uh, processed in the HPC center. So you're not necessarily exposing those identifiers to um, the, pl the platform providers to potentially to other researchers. So the great thing about uh, pseudonymized, uh, pseudonymization is, it, it, of course, it does lower the privacy risk. Uh, even if there is a breach of pseudonymized data, the, the potential harms are, are potentially, the, the likelihood of, of that the individual is re-identified re -identified is still lower. Um, but it is key to remember that Unlike in other, certain other jurisdictions, such as the U.S., this sort of coded data, pseudonymized data, is, is actually still subject to the GDPR. It's still considered personal data, and that's why we're typically uh, dealing with personal data in precision medicine projects. Uh, however, there are certain legal advantages beyond simply assisting you with compliance, uh, assisting you with demonstrating compliance that you've lowered risks. Um, there are other certain legal advantages that it relaxes certain obligations of the controller. Um, for one, it makes it a little bit easier. It's typically pseudonymization is sort of required if you want to rely on certain exceptions in the GDPR to do scientific research, um, to do further processing of data for scientific research purposes, and you can uh, it can relax certain obligations. Uh, you know, data subject rights might be limited if you're dealing with data that, that cannot be uh, identified directly to the individual. Uh, but again, a key challenge is that pseudonymized, you know, is sort of confusing this concept that a pseudonymized data is anonymized. That oh if I just delete the you know if I just delete that database of identifiers or, or the link then my data set's anonymized no you actually you know because the the identification standard is is higher for anonymization uh, that data set may actually still be you know include uh, indirect identifiers so moving so that's again coming back to this you know I'm driving this point home uh, it's it's quite difficult you know essentially in many applications in in um, in, in PERMED, uh, we're, we're likely to be using, especially when that data is derived from patients, from human subjects, uh, we're likely to be dealing with um, um, personal data. 
meaning we need to comply with the principles of the GDPR. And so in the second phase, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, kind of assessing and mitigating uh, ri uh, risk and ensuring compliance with the GDPR. Um, so there's a number of key principles in the GDPR, but because we're focusing on this, this um, case of taking research data, um, transferring it to a HPC and, and analyzing it, uh, you know, I'll be focusing on, on a sort of subset of principles today, kind of assuming you have your, your lawful basis uh, for processing as, as a researcher, um, that you've been transparent with the, with the data subjects, but I'll focus on how do we ensure when we're, we're using these kind of uh, platforms uh, that we respect other principles like data minimization, purpose limitation, uh, confidentiality, which is largely linked to security safeguards, as well as, you know, a key point I want to drive home today is, is, is accountability. Um, so I've mentioned this accountability principle already, but another, and again, I want to tie it to the work we did in the permit project. So a key thing we did, another deliverable we had was because there was a potential that this project, even in the use cases, would be using, um, would be using um, health and genetic, special category health and genetic data, uh, from patients, um, there was a question of whether we even to do the study, we may actually need to conduct a data protection impact assessment. Uh, it turned out that we we did uh, we concluded that we didn't legally need to do it for the use versus use cases per se, but um, there are important considerations for many future applications of, of permit where we do use pay, pay data from vulnerable patients, um, where the the legal criteria uh, would potentially apply, and we would be required to conduct the DPIA. So often, when you're dealing with special category health and genetic data, there's a question of whether you have to do a DPIA. Um, but of course, we don't just see this as a as a mere compliance obligation. A DPIA is a great opportunity to demonstrate uh, that our, our processing is is compliant. And I think in research, we we often say, well, you know, why are we making a big deal about this? We're, we don't have the person's name. We're not making decisions about them. We're just generating, we're just analyzing data for, for knowledge purposes. Uh, we're only using pseudonymized data. But why are we making a big deal that this is high risk? Well, I think it's good to see a DPI as an opportunity to demonstrate that those assumptions are actually true, that we actually have some, you know, uh, safeguards in place that we're, to ensure we're only using data for research purposes and that the recipients are only using uh, data for the purposes that we, we, we are instructing them to and, and also um, that the data we're using is actually we've actually you know assessed that it that it has a low low chance of uh, linking back to the individual. Now, just very briefly from a legal perspective, what what criteria do we look at? There's so there's legal uh, there, there's criteria in the GDPR as well as in uh, additional guidance from the European Data Protection Board and as well as member states about uh, under what in certain usually it's kind of like two if two of the criteria criteria are met, then you're legally required. This is potentially high risk processing and you're legally required to do uh, a, a DPIA. Um, so the first is processing on a large scale of special categories of data. So of course, you know, by, by definition permit is focused on exascale processing. Uh, certainly there's gonna be health and genetic data involved if we're dealing with patients and human subjects. Um, so, uh, but of course, uh, you know, there is some, Gray, you know, gray around what, what is large scale processing. So maybe you don't have a lot of data subjects, but you're processing high volumes of data. Are you processing over a long period of time and a, and a large geography? Um, so, you know, there is some argumentation there, but, but of course it's gonna be kind of a question mark about whether we consider that some applications of permit to be large scale. Some will certainly be large scale processing. And of course, if you're dealing with vulnerable uh, data subjects or new technologies that might come with new risks, uh, there's a chance of higher risk. So what, what, when you do a DPA, again, it's sort of like any risk assessment that focused on data protection, you know, what are the steps? So I think the first key step of a, D, a data protection impact assessment and demonstrating, you know, being able to demonstrate compliance with the GDPR is to actually describe the processing, why you're doing it, you know, what kinds of data are you, are you uh, collecting, are you linking, are you, are, you are you delivering to the HPC center, um, who are all the parties involved? The collaborators, which ones of them are controllers? Is you know, are you dealing with an external party who's providing the HPC? Are they a, are they a processor? So especially when you deal with these these complex consortia, you know, even de de even defining who is the controller can be a large challenge. And that's of course this obligation to conduct a DPIA falls to the controller. So what we've seen in consortia is often helpful to have a DPIA template. The consortia as a whole is not responsible for data protection compliance. But of course, can help all of those parties figure out their roles and and how why what they're processing data for and what the overall aims are. 
And then each of those controllers can adopt it into their local um, templates. The next step is to essentially assess, you know, do what, what data do I need to fulfill my aims? And, and, and do I need all the data that I'm suggesting? So this ties to the data minimization principle, um, you know, kind of using only the data you need to achieve the goals. Of course, in, in kind of big data science, this is, you know, sometimes this principle seems to have limited application. Of course, we want, you know, all sorts of data types and fields and look for new correlations. But of course, in terms of, you know, we certainly don't need the individual's identifier. So can we deal with at least pseudonymized data um, or even, you know, in some cases to answer that particular question, can we deal with anonymized data? Um, then we need to assess, you know, the, the risks to the individual. Um, <clears throat> again, this is an, you know, an aspect of a DPA is it's really focused on data protection risks. It's really focused on risk to the data subjects, meaning the patients or human subjects from which the data is derived. But of course, often in these discussions, you know, we, we realize there's a number of other risks to, uh, you know, that, that, you know, there's risk to the, uh, the scientists, uh, to keeping their data confidential. Um, so, but again, the DPA does try to focus specifically on the risk of data subject. Of course, if we're just doing kind of research, uh, you know, secondary use research, um, trying to create generalizable knowledge, we are not making decisions about, say, for example, patient care. But if, of course, these more personalized uh, models do get developed and we start to deliver data back to patients, then of course we can, this can have a substantial impact if we, if we haven't kept data, you know, ensured the integrity of data, for example, um, this can have a big impact on data subjects. But the key, the key issue really is what if there's a breach that people are re-identified and unauthorized party use it against the individual. So we tend to actually consider these risks that the impact of a breach when we're dealing with special category uh, data that it is high. And, and there's nothing we can do to change that. If there is a breach and this data is released, whole genome sequence data, for example, that, that we consider this to be a, you know, a high risk to the individual. However, what we can do is reduce the probability of this risk. So just a kind of qualitative, often we start with a qualitative risk assessment, you know, that what, what are the probability of this happening and what is the severity if it, if it uh, arises. The next step is to, you know, this is, um, you know, to identify the measures uh, that would be used to address the risks. So again, we can lower the probability, for example, of a, of a breach or misuse of data. And this is where, you know, it's, it's really key that the, the, that the HPC that we've developed guidelines and we demonstrate that the HPC environment is, is secure and that the software we're using is, is, is safe. So and that's something that Sarah will touch on later. But so that's actually, this is where, again, the controller may not be able to answer all these questions on their own, but when selecting an HPC, they're accountable for ensuring that, that uh, you know, that appropriate safeguards are in place. Um, so just briefly, you know, you may have heard of the European Health Data Space, which aims to compel health data holders to make data available in, in a secure and transparent manner. In that case, you would be able to access health data um, um, through national data uh, access bodies, and they would have to, just to give you a few examples of the kinds of, of secure, you know, security standards you might expect, if this is an example from kind of uh, a draft uh, le uh, legislation. Um, so almost uh, wrapping up here, um, but then the last kind of step is, okay, so now we, we've identified the risk, we've identified the, you know, our, our list of safeguards to ensure that there's not going to be a data breach uh, to reduce that risk. Then the last step is to kind of assess, reassess the re residual risk. So if you've lowered the probability of, of a breach, then, then perhaps you conclude this is no longer going to be high-risk processing. If it is still going to be high-risk processing, you may need to consult with data protection authorities or uh, the communities from which you're collecting data. And of course, because all of this is about being able to demonstrate compliance, it's key to, to uh, document the results of your DPA. So I just wanted to quickly thank uh, a number of my teammates that, that work on this project. And, and of course, we're, we're kind of doing these DPAs for a number of consortiums. So it's been a valuable experience to uh, work on the principles uh, in this project. And I'll pass it over to my colleague. OK, so um, as Adrian already mentioned, I will um, now talk about more the security aspects, so basically the technical part of, <clears throat> of all of this. So. I, Adrian already quite mentioned a bit of what are the threats when we reach exascale. <clears throat> so I will uh, also list a few of those. Then I will uh, mention why HPC is specific uh, sometimes in, in regards of security. And then I will basically dive into all the possible security measures that you can take to reduce uh, the risk of your processing. And I will have a short um, 
details about if you're actually developing software, what to pay attention there. So usually when we uh, talk about risk assessment, <clears throat> mostly there are like three technical threats which are considered, which is the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the data. So those three things need to be protected, meaning we don't want any authorized, unauthorized access to the data. We want to make sure that the data does not get altered, and we make sure that the data will always be available and not um, accidentally get deleted or disappear at some point. Then, especially when we reach exascale or go to HPC, uh, we have additional risks that are more on the methodological side, which Adrian already touched on. So basically, it's always a problem if you are able to re-identify a person, although you might deal with pseudonymized data. Um, if you're looking at genetic data and you're doing large-scale processing, you might still be able to pick out certain aspects um, in the genome that might be able to re-identify a person. Um, and then profiling is when you are working with uh, data from a lot of people, and then based on comparison between uh, the different uh, data sets and the different people, you may also be able to single out individuals. Uh, here in Luxembourg, for example, this is especially interesting because we're usually looking at a very small population. Um, so if you figure out certain uh, individual criteria for people, you have a wide likelihood that there are very few people in Luxembourg who actually have these. Okay, so now when we go to the HPC, there are some things we keep in mind when talking about HPC systems, uh, specifically HPC clusters. So usually this is a shared environment which means that we have many users that are working on the same system, at least on the access node, um, you will have a lot of people there. And those people may even include externals, not part of the institute that is hosting the HPC. In many cases, also these systems are directly accessible from the internet. So you do not need to be in the university network um, to access them. <clears throat> and if some credentials are breached, uh, anybody could uh, get access. Also, usually the focus in HPC systems is the speed and not the security. So usually when you design an HPC system, you mostly design it in a way that the computation is as fast as possible. Then when you are dealing with an HPC system, most of the time, since you are the one analyzing data, you're probably just the user on the system and not the person who is designing the system. And you might also have limited influence on the design of the system because there are many other use cases of people using HPC and for them probably speed is more important than security. So usually it might be a bit tricky to enforce certain security aspects on the HPC system because it will impact the computational speed of other users. So therefore, when I will now talk about the security measures that you can take on HPC system, I will focus on things you can do as a user on the system, not when designing the system. Okay, so first there are some general recommendations before we dive into like the specific measures. So no matter what I say now, you should of course always follow your institutes and project security guidelines foremost and also any guidelines you got from the data owner, from the consent that the patient signed and so on. Also always ensure that the legal documents for your processing are in place. And in general, you should always implement proper data management. Ideally, you at the beginning of the project do a data management plan and you should always know which data you have, where it is and who has access to it. So then I will now present a set of baseline security measures. So this is measures you should always implement, even if you're not dealing with sensitive or personal data. So when we look at data transfer and storage, so really technical things you can do here to, to safeguard your data is first to encrypt any data transfer. So when you're downloading or uploading data somewhere to always have this in an encrypted channel, um, to follow the data minimization principle and only store the necessary data that you really need for your processing on the HPC 
should also separate different kinds of data. That's the data separation principle, which is also written down in the GDPR. Um, it's also a good idea to have metadata along with your data to at least give some basic information like who is responsible for this data set and if there are any specific restrictions on using it. For the data management, you should always know where the data is stored. I already mentioned this. Then you should also keep your copies of data to minimum. That's basically similar to data minimization. So um, do not have the data in five different users' home directories, but uh, share, store it in a shared space so that there's only one copy where different users have access. It's also a good idea to write protect your input or raw data. This basically protects the in integrity of your data to not have accidentally somebody like overwrite the input data and then without noticing. To ensure the availability of the data, you should always check that there are backups. And for the data management part, you should also know where are those backups stored, who has access to them, how long are they kept, and so on. And then also very important aspect, which is just a tiny technical thing, but it's very important to always create and also check checksums, uh, both regularly and after data transfers. So if you do this, this basically ensures that the data does not get altered during a transfer or silently when in storage. So especially in the case of transfers, there are some cases where you might not notice, for example, if a file has not been transferred in its entirety and you're like missing the last three lines of the file. But if you have a checksum, you will know that something has changed. Okay, then when you start, like you have the data there, you give people access. Uh, so we need to talk about identifying people and how to give access. So you should always verify the identity of your users. So well, that's like a very generic thing to say. Um, but one way to do this is to always use institute email addresses when communication, uh, when communicating, especially when communicating access credentials. At least usually there you will know who is the person behind this. Uh, Why when you use like Outlook or Yahoo email addresses, that could be anybody. You should also have a process for adding and removing access. So who needs to basically approve that people leave the institute or leave the project. Then also in line with the um, data minimization principle, you should use fine-grained access control lists and only provide minimal access to users. So you should not give a newcomer by default access to all the data that you have in full permissions, but only to really the data sets that the person needs to do their work and only as minimal permissions as necessary. So usually only read permissions, but not no way to change the data or to write data. Then of course, to do your processing, when you have your data, you are logged in on the system, you need to use some software to do the processing. Um, there you should also pay attention that you only use like trusted software. So what does that mean? So things you can look for in software is if there have been security audits, if it's well maintained, if it has a large user base and an active community, if there are multiple contributors, or it's from a well-known company or institute, or you have the results already verified somewhere or published. This all basically guarantees you that there are a lot of people that have been working with the software, have been looking over it, and that any security problems are identified quickly and also fixed quickly. So if there are any security problems identified, of course, you need to apply software updates regularly to make sure if something like that happens, you also get the patched software. You should also always make sure to download software only from official sources. So not from any link that you just found by Google or something, but really go to the project website or to the Institute website and look there for the official download link to make sure you get something that has not been tampered with. At this point, it's also a good idea to again check checksums, not only for data, but also for software packages. Okay, then uh, when you have also your software, you're going to run a job on the cluster to do the analysis. Uh, so things to pay attention there is, for example, to reserve always full nodes on the cluster. So for some HPC systems, this is anyway the default, 
but not on all systems. If you don't reserve a full node, it's possible that there's another user who's also running uh, processes on the same hardware that you are using, and then he will have better chances of seeing what you're doing. For example, at least you will be able to see which processes you're running, which command line arguments you're using, uh, and so on. You should always also always be aware of temporary directories and make sure you empty them when the job is finished, but also when the job has failed. So there's a lot of software who like writes in temporary directories and then uh, does not clean it up, for example. And uh, depending on how the setup is on the HPC cluster, the scheduler might also not clean this up. So you should be careful that you don't leave any like half process data somewhere in a temporary directory. Then, uh, of course, you also use something to access the HPC or to access also web services, to access maybe data sharing locations. Um, so to secure all these kind of accesses, you should always use multi-factor authentication when it's possible. Should also use obviously secure passwords. So secure means that ideally you have a very long password. That's like the best. If it needs to be shorter, you should you need to add basically more special characters and 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 things like that. Um, then for HPC systems, you usually use SSH keys. In this case, you should use um, RSA keys that are at least 4,906 bit long or elliptical keys. And all the keys should be secured with a passphrase, meaning if somebody somehow gets access to your file system and steals your SSH key, that they cannot use it without knowing the passphrase. Then uh, we are basically going out of the HPC step by step. So now we arrived at your local computer. Of course, this is basically the entry point uh, for accessing the data. So this also needs to be secured. Uh, one basic measure is to just run an antivirus and anti-malware software. Um, also to always install updates to software and operating system. It's also a very good idea to encrypt your disk uh, in any case, um, because this also means that when you lose your laptop or it gets stolen, nobody will have access to the data that is on your laptop and also not uh, no access to any access credentials like SSH keys that you might have stored there. And it's also a good idea to always lock your screen, ideally automatically. So when you leave your desk, um, that your screen is locked and there are no other colleagues that basically can look on your screen, see what you're doing, or even go in and, and access any data that you're working on. Also, even worse, for example, if you take your laptop to a conference and, and then you leave it there while you have a break, uh, anybody basically could access whatever is on there while you're not around. So this was all like the very technical part that you can do. There's also a bit of organizational measures that you can take this largely evolve around like having policies and doing training. So for example, at the LCSB, we do data security training for all newcomers. Uh, so meaning everybody that joins the Institute will get like a baseline data security training uh, within the first month. Uh, then you should also have a process for security incident reporting. So if somebody happens or you think something happened that you really know who to contact and what to do in that case, because there are certain uh, deadlines that you need to meet in order uh, to follow the GDPR. And you should also have a process to proactively report possible vulnerabilities and also encourage people to do that. So if somebody notices that something somewhere is not up to date or something looks fishy or there's a gap somewhere that the people actually know where to take this information so somebody can take action to basically um, close any vulnerabilities. So this was only really the baseline you should always do. <laughs> now, if we really talk about personal or sensitive data, you should do more than that. Um, so you should definitely, that this, the GDPR tells you that, encrypt your data at rest. So it's a bit tricky to define what means at rest, but in principle, the more it's encrypted, the, the better it is. So ideally only really 
decrypted while you're actually actively processing is and otherwise it's always encrypted. It's also a good idea to containerize your analysis workflow um, because this means you will have full control on the whole environment, including the operating system, all kinds of system libraries and all this kind of things. Because on an HPC system, you cannot be sure that really all system libraries are up to date and all security uh, vulnerabilities are patched. And then if you have the possibility, the best thing you can do is using a secure computing environment. So what I mean by that is basically what we call an air-gapped system. So a system that has no direct internet access, so no, no data channel in or out. So both ways doesn't work. So that means any data that's going into the system, any data that's going out of the system is manually monitored and approved. Um, and also any software that is running on the system is thoroughly checked beforehand. Okay, so now let's take a brief look into software development. So I could have a whole nother webinar just on discussing software development issues. So this will be very quick, just as a few pointers. So we have a whole deliverable that will be out very soon on the software development aspect. Um, you can look this up on the website and then look there for details. So basically, so you should always follow software development best practices. I mean, that's kind of clear uh, because some of them also really also contribute to the security of the software. They ensure you have proper processes, things are controlled, and these kind of things. Another important aspect is to consider security already in the design phase of your software. So do not write the whole software and then think about the security of it. Immediately when you start thinking how to develop the software, include all kind of security aspects. Think what you can do to make it more secure. And then since the main thing we are evolving around here is data, when you develop software, you pay specific attention to anything you do with data, meaning file operations, for example. Do not overwrite files. Check where you write files, check that you don't write existing files, don't change input data, write the output data somewhere else. If you, you should actually not transfer any data ideally, so definitely do not send usage statistic to the developer, for example. If you need to query external databases for information, make this an optional feature, make the user aware that this is happening. It's also good to always deal with encryption. So if you do transfers, have them encrypted. Also maybe provide the option to read encrypted files and immediately write encrypted files. So it's easier for the user and there's like the data is not lying around unencrypted for extended times. Another important aspect is to fail securely. So there's always something that can happen and your software crashes. But in this case, what can happen is you have for example, incomplete output files, you might still have temporary files lying around somewhere in a temporary directory. And your aim should be to somehow notice that you're failing, also communicate clearly to the user that the software has failed. So the user knows that they need to check it and remove any incomplete output and also any temporary data in, in any, any folders. Um, because for some data types, for example, especially in genomics, we are often dealing with line-based data and you will not know if they are missing five lines at the end of your file. Uh, and then on top of that, you should, if you're dealing with secrets or with passwords, best to just avoid, to, to require this at all. But if you somehow have this, make sure you have safe ways to read secrets, not store secrets. Um, and um, basically just make sure that uh, they are not readable by other people. For example, if you pass a password on a comment line, that will be visible to all other people uh, that are on the same system. So this is not something you should do. Okay, so if you want more details on software development, there's like 10 pages or so in the deliverable. Okay, um, so that's it for the technical side. Um, I need to thank all of the involved permanent people, both on our side at the University of Luxembourg, but also all the reviewers from the other institute that has have typed writing all the 
deliverables on which this presentation is based. So, and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can write them using the Q&A button. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Adrian, for that uh, very nice uh, overview of all these uh, different aspects. So yes, please use the, the Q&A button to ask any questions you may have. And uh, while we wait, we wait for questions. I I have a couple of things I wanted to to ask. Um, so, um, yeah, Adrian, you mentioned that it, sometimes when you work in this large consortia of different partners, it can be difficult even to like to know who is the data controller. I I understood. So. What, what do you do when, like in this consortia, what do you do when the, the data controller partner has stricter or more relaxed rules than other institutions? Like, I guess that might create conflict when, when you have to share data. So thanks for that tough question to start off. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's a number of aspects to this. So um, first of all, and we actually, uh, if you, um, we actually have a publication on controllership and scientific data sharing uh, in international data privacy law. So and maybe people interested could follow up there. But uh, essentially, uh, the first question is just about the role. So I think, first of all, just describe practically what's happening. What are you doing? Who's who's asking research questions? Who's analyzing data? Why is it happening? So why is the processing happening is a key aspect of controllership, uh, determining controllership. Um, so describe, you know, the data flows, the you know, the the aims and things like that. That's a great starting point. And then try and ask, okay, who's who's potentially controller, joint controller, processor here? Um, <clears throat> of course, another key aspect of that we address in our paper is that controlling applies to the processing, not to the data. So there's not a controller for the data. It's not the hospital who generate the data that's necessarily the control, the sole controller, or the, or the controller throughout the whole data lifecycle. The controller can change across the, the life cycle. So when we talk about a secondary use in a study, we ask who's the controller for this, you know, for the research project for the study. And so, you know, the, the control, they have to work out, the, the network has to work out, are we all collaborating together on this study and thus we're joint controllers or am I passing you the data and then, um, and you, and you're analyzing for your own purpose and then you become the only controller. Of course, there's still neat, there's still a lot of security that, and, and, and other aspects that we need to coordinate on and, and pseudonymization and security. There's a lot of coordination regardless of who's necessarily the specific controller at any particular time, but it's important to identify those uh, responsibilities. Then and the final part of your question was about, you know, maybe different different levels of, of, of security and, and or different approaches, maybe standards for data protection. And of course, this is, you know, a, a long-term question that in the consortium, you, you Obviously, you need to work out minimal standards. So often, we take a standards approach that everyone has to meet this minimal standard. Um, uh, if you are, you know, if you are analyzing your own data in your own environment, or people are coming into your environment, then of course you're going to have a bit more flexibility around that. But the the consortia will hold, you know, the partners will hold each other responsible to meet minimal standards. Okay. Okay. No, thank you for that uh, for that response. I think it was very uh, complete and comprehensive. Um, also, Sarah, uh, when you you mentioned that uh, a good way to um, guarantee the, the identification of the uh, persons trying to access data can be using the institutional email address, um, we have come up, we did come across situations where there are still countries in the world, there are areas in the world where uh, institutional email address might not be an option. Um, so. What would you recommend, like as an alternative? It's just personal email address and trying to ask for a second proof of identity or something. Yeah, it's it's quite tricky. I mean, usually we go via somebody who knows that person, right? Usually have if I'm now the managing a user accounts, I usually have somebody in my group who knows the collaborator actually and basically have already communicated with them for a certain a number of time across a specific email address. So basically we ask other people to verify this email address. Um, that's one approach. The other approach is to also use the second factor 
like you use, uh, for example, uh, a phone number or something like that, to basically that you have like two aspects and the person need to be in control of both of them, like like use for regular multi-factor authentication as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay. otherwise, I mean, I mean, the best of things is to basically hand them a sheet of paper, you know, when they are physically present, but that's <laughs> always possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, it was also mentioned that in a slide uh, a, that to proactively report possible vulner vulnerabilities. So, uh, also when working in a consortium project, uh, how like should that be made explicit to the partners? Should it may be made explicit to the partners? What would be the procedure to report vulnerabilities? To whom they should report? Or is that something assumed that everyone knows? I don't know if this question is for one of you particularly or for both. Um, yeah, I think it largely, I would say the responsibility and you should report to the person who is responsible of the environment you're working in. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to have a consortium wide um, responsible, but in the case for PAMET, for example, that each uh, HPC cluster that is used to have uh, to do processing has a contact for these kind of uh, situations, right? And they can then immediately contact like the admins of the system who can remedy the situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe just briefly ask, uh, uh, address from a breach reporting under GDPR. If personal, if there's a breach of personal data in an HPC center, assuming that's an external party, a processor, they'll have an obligation to report to the controller so that the, the data providers, uh, research organization providing data to the center, and then those uh, institutions may have, depending on the kind of the risk to the individual, they may have obligations to report that to uh, um, um, to supervisory authorities or to even the data subject themselves. Uh, probably rare in these kind of contexts, but in biomedical research contexts. But um, of course, the consortium partners will also voluntarily probably share data with each other because they have a shared set of vulnerabilities. So, so often they might develop this in a consortium policy that even if the breach doesn't necessarily affect one partner, they'll share information so the other partners can can uh, you know avoid this a similar outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, uh, let's give it another minute to see if there are more questions. Um, I, I will also uh, ask one. Uh, it was also uh, mentioned that the data. Uh, security situation is a. Uh, it has to be revisited. Like your procedures have to be revisited. Um, so, also when again when you work with different partners, thinking about uh, maybe international projects, uh, like how how frequently should you do that? Uh, can it also happen that uh, some partners don't believe that, they, that there is a need to revisit the situation? That it's just more. I don't know bureaucracy or admin work that they don't that it's not needed. It can this that situation happen? And who has the responsibility? Is it, is it again a data a data controller? Um, I guess I could start. Maybe sorry, help me out a bit. But uh, um, so this is yeah, revising the security uh, policies. You know, again, yes, the accountability is with the controller. So you know they are. You know, ultimately responsible for maintaining you know, appropriate security safeguards over time. Um, <clears throat> but of course, you know, this is, I think I mentioned at one point about assistance from the processor. So, really, of course, if you have a whole, a whole consortium, they're all using one computing environment. It, it, it's kind of more efficient if that, you know, that computing environment is, is doing security risk assessments, uh, continuously monitoring, continuously updating those. And, and then sharing that information with the, with the with the with the controllers who can then you know say well look I've received this updated you know it still looks good to me so I'm still meeting my I believe I'm still meeting demonstrating my compliance um, and of course there's a move towards greater uh, uh, with all of these uh, European uh, initiatives the One Health Human Genomes Initiative the Health European Health Data Space there's a move towards you know having uh, greater the clear standards, um, whether they're in the law themselves or they're in regulatory documents or they're part of certification processes. So certifying 
you know, probably the future is, is a, a smaller number of secure processing environments that follow high levels of, of continuous security uh, standards and have this certified. And then the controllers and the consortia can ask fewer questions because they know that as long as they use those, you know, well-funded, uh, highly secure environments, uh, once we figure that out, then, uh, you know, life should be more straightforward, but also, uh, you know, we should have be more confident that they'll be secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from more technical side, usually what we like recommend around is like every half a year or so to check like access credentials, like, you know, go through the user list, uh, see all the people who have access, are they still supposed to have access, are they still working on this project, and so on. And then if you do risk assessments, you usually revisit them once a year, basically, and um, check again, have you implemented additional measures in the meantime? So does anything in the risk assessment change? That's mm -hmm. like ballpark mm -hmm. numbers. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Okay, there was a question in the chat. Uh, for personal PCs, what antivirus and anti-malware do you recommend? Oh, yeah, that's a difficult question. <laughs> So that depends very much on what you're using, if you're using uh, Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Um, so just to mention explicitly, I would also on Mac OS and on Linux use antivirus and anti malware, although those systems are usually not targeted uh, so much nowadays. Um, for Windows, I think there's currently, if you have an up-to-date Windows system, the inbuilt Windows Defender is actually uh, good. So you can just make sure that this one is always up to date. Um, I think for um, Mac OS actually at now here at the Institute level, we are actually also using Microsoft Defender even for Mac OS. <laughs> that works. <laughs> uh, so, um, and for Linux, um, I'm not sure I would have to look that up, um, but I think mostly anything you use is okay. I don't. I'm not aware of any specific programs that are not suitable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for very much for all those responses. Uh, so just before finishing, can you see my screen? Yeah. So just before finishing, I would just like uh, to conclude to uh, remind our participants of the upcoming. Uh, webinars and courses that uh, are now open for registration that uh, will take place in November. So you can uh, visit the Permit COE website and, and take a look at them and register. And of course, you can also find them, find there the recordings from the past webinars. And finally, also uh, stay tuned for the, for the Permit COE Summer School that is going to take place in uh, June, 2023. Uh, now in the website and through the QR codes, you can register interest. And once uh, the applications are open, uh, you will be you will be informed, and you can find all the information on our website. So um, with that, I would just like uh, to conclude by saying thank you very much to Adrian and Sarah for this uh, really interesting webinar, and see you at the next session. Thank you all.